Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for the third DRAG lecture. We're delighted to see such a large audience joining us for this seminar. I am Jonathan Stewart, professor and former chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department in the Samueli School of Engineering at UCLA. Let me describe a little bit about this event. We are most grateful to Leslie and Dennis Drag, who created this lecture series to bring seminars on topical and timely subjects to our civil and environmental engineering community of students, alumni, faculty, and affiliated professionals. Our drag lecturers are recognized in the department office uh, with a plaque. Now, normally these lectures are offered on campus. It's a major campus event for us. And this year we've gone virtual. Uh, the original lecture was to take place in March, but as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, we've decided to go virtual so that we can provide uh, to our students and the broader community uh, engaging ways to stay connected. Uh, and so we are delighted that you're joining us here today. I would ask that you use the Q&A feature in Zoom. If you have any questions that you would like to submit to the speaker, we will take questions at the end. I should also notify you at this point that this lecture is being recorded. And let me now introduce our speaker. So our speaker today, uh, the 2020 drag lecture, is Dr. Sarah Minson. Dr. Minson is a research geophysicist at the US Geological Survey in Northern California, and she's been there since 2014. She holds a PhD in geophysics from Caltech, and she is a leader in the development of the earthquake early warning system in California. Welcome, Dr. Minson. Hi, um, thank you everyone. Let me start my video. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming out today. I am just going to attempt to share my screen so you can see some slides. Um, Bear with me. First of all, thank you so much for putting up with whatever random technical issues arise today. And thank you so much for coming out. Um, hopefully you can now see a set of slides on the screen. And I wanna start by thanking all of you, thanking UCLA for having me virtually and thanking my wonderful colleagues, collaborators and co-authors, Anne-Marie Balte, Elizabeth Cochran, Tom Hanks and, Man and Menandrine Meyer. So we're going to talk today about earthquake early warning. The Shake Alert earthquake early warning system is being built for the west coast of the United States. It's currently operating in California. It went live last fall on the 30th anniversary of the Loma Prieta earthquake. And so right now, today, if there was an earthquake that produced significant shaking, your phone should go off with an alert from the emergency alert system. Or optionally, if you downloaded some app that subscribes to, the, to Shake Alert, you will also receive alerts that way. And the choice of making the system public on the Loma Prieta anniversary was really quite an excellent choice because Loma Prieta was also the first time that earthquake early warning was ever used in the United States. As you might recall, tragically, the single biggest loss of life during that earthquake was when the Cypress Street viaduct collapsed near Oakland. And in the days that followed, there were lots of uh, workers and rescuers climbing around on this very damaged, very fragile piece of infrastructure. And so what the USGS did was put seismometers in the Santa Cruz Mountains near the epicenter of the Loma Prieta earthquake. And every time they detected an aftershock, they would send a radio signal to a receiver at the Cypress Street viaduct so that the people who were crawling around on that damaged viaduct could get an alert to take protective action to um, limit the possible damage from an earthquake that was occurring, an aftershock. So what is earthquake early warning? Well, it's basically that exactly. The idea is that you have 
seismometers located so that they can pick up an earthquake wherever it starts. And they use information from the first arriving wave, the P wave, to try and determine the location and magnitude of that earthquake. And then they send out an alert based on that. And the amount of warning time you get is simply the difference between when you receive that alert and when the strong damaging shaking, which is typically carried by the S wave that travels at three and a half kilometers a second, which is about two miles a second, arrives at your location. So there's some area right on top of the earthquake where unfortunately you can't get an alert because the system is just detecting that the earthquake has started and trying to estimate a location and a magnitude. But then the alert goes out and the farther away you are, the longer it takes for the shaking to get to you and thus the more warning time you get. Um, so let's look at this in detail. Let's look at the shakeout scenario, which is a large rupture on the Southern San Andreas Fault that starts near the Salton Sea and then heads towards Los Angeles. So again, the idea is that the earthquake starts and the seismometers pick it up and they start analyzing it. And so there was unfortunately some area that can't get an alert. But then an alert goes out and the amount of warning you get is how long it takes for the shaking to get you. So it takes 25 seconds for the shaking to arrive in Palm Springs. So you get 25 seconds of warning to Palm Springs, 50 seconds of warning to San Bernardino, a minute 10 to Anaheim, and a minute and a half to Los Angeles. Um, you so similarly, if there was a repeat of the 1906 earthquake, but it started as far away from San Francisco as possible up near Cape Mendocino, you could get a minute and a half warning before the shaking arrived in San Francisco. Or if there was a great Cascadia earthquake that again, conveniently started as far away from Seattle as possible, such that it took, takes five minutes for the shaking to get to Seattle, then again, you could get five minutes of shaking in Seattle. And this is a story you see absolutely everywhere. You see it in newspaper articles, like in these pictures I grabbed from the New York Times, the Washington Post. You see it in handouts from early warning systems around the world, like in these figures I got from the Japanese and Chinese early warning systems. And you see it in lots and lots and lots of journal articles. But here's the thing. Everything I've told you so far is wrong. Oops. And there's really a great lesson here, right? Scientific discovery is a process. Science is a living, breathing, evolving thing. And there's lots of work that still needs to be done. And what we know tomorrow may be amazing and different from what we know today. So for the rest of this talk, let's instead answer the question, why doesn't earthquake early warning work this way? And how does earthquake early warning really work? Okay, so the first thing is that the name is terrible. It is not earthquake early warning. We are not warning for earthquakes. The earthquake has already happened. What we are doing is warning you before the shaking arrives at your location. It's shaking early warning. And that's where things get tricky because earthquakes are rather simple, right? They are a thing. Loma Prieta was a magnitude 6.9 earthquake on October 17, 1989 at 5.04 p.m. But shaking is different for different people, right? If you look at this picture on the bottom, you see that there's very strong shaking in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, near where um, the earthquake originated. There was sadly a very strong bit of uh, amplification right here near Oakland, which is where the Cypress Street Viaduct was collapsed. But throughout um, Northern Bay Area, which is oddly on your left in this figure, the shaking is relatively weak. So who do you send warnings to? Well, I think that depends on who you are. Because for example, if you have a vase that you love that has been handed down in your family for generations, then you care about even weak shaking that could knock that vase over and break it. But if you're operating a train system, then I don't know that you care about weak shaking. You probably don't care about anything other than strong shaking that could potentially damage your tracks and cause a derailment. But also, but the lady with the vase and the train have in common is that I think they're relatively false alert tolerant, right? If I warn the lady with the vase that there was going to be shaking and then it turns out to be very weak, well, what's the worst that's happened? She's grabbed her vase, nothing bad happened, and she lets go and goes about her day. Same with the train. If I warn that train and the train stops and then the shaking turns out not to be very strong, then the train just starts back up again. Perhaps nothing particularly bad has happened. But that's not true. For everyone, some actions have serious consequences. I mean, what if you're talking about cutting off the gas to a major metropolitan area? Or what if you're talking about a scram, an emergency shutdown of a nuclear power plant, right? Those things have serious repercussions. And I really should emphasize that these are all 
fictional examples. I am not a train engineer. I am not a nuclear engineer. I'm not any kind of engineer. I'm just putting these out here as potential thought experiments about what certain user situations might look like. And some users have, might be considering protective action that has serious consequences. This is something that we have really gotten to know well in California recently, where Pacific Gas and Electric has been conducting public safety power shutoffs um, to reduce wildfire risk and that is very important and that is a huge public safety issue but at the same time there are serious repercussions. UC Berkeley claimed that they lost $500,000 in cancer research, right? Shutting off the power can be very difficult on people who are oxygen dependent or have other medical needs that require power. So some people may be tolerant of false alarms but some actions may only be possible to take if you know for sure that the shaking is going to be damaging. So who do you warn? Well, again, it depends who you are. So for Loma Prieta, if you're down in the South Bay, which again is oddly on the right side of this figure, and the shaking was very strong. So yeah, if you're the lady with the vase, you want to be warned. Heck, if you're the fictional nuclear power plant that cares about strong shaking, you probably want to be warned too. But even a little ways up the peninsula, the shaking was probably not strong enough that a serious, heavy industrial application necessarily would want, it to, be, would want to be warned, although the shaking was certainly strong enough that the lady with the vase would want to be warned. And of course, if you were way far away, the shaking would be so weak that probably nobody would want to be warned. And that's for the Loma Prieta earthquake. If instead this had been the 1906 earthquake, which ruptured all the way from San Juan Batista in the south up to Cape Mendocino in the north, well then, there was strong shaking across the entire length of that long rupture. And yes, people everywhere around that rupture would probably want to be warned, both the lady with the vase and heavy industrial users. So figuring out who to warn and who not to warn is a question of how strong the shaking is going to be, which in turn is a question of how far away is this rupture and how large is its magnitude? Because typically the way that you forecast shaking is through what's called a ground motion prediction equation. This is an, an empirical relationship whereby if you know the magnitude of the earthquake and how far away from it you are, you know what the expected maximum shaking is. So this is a plot of one particular ground motion prediction equation, Chair and Young's 2014, um, showing expected shaking as a function of distance from an earthquake. And the lines represent different magnitude earthquakes, ranging from a magnitude four in purple up to a magnitude eight in yellow. And I'm showing shaking intensity in percent G. So this is percent of the force of gravity. 100% G is the force that you're feeling right now as you sit in your chair and the seat pushes back against you. 10% G is one tenth of that, 1% G is one hundredth of that. And the four horizontal lines represent different shaking levels. So 2% G is about the strength of shaking where you would go, yeah, that's shaking, that's an earthquake. So let's say that that's the level of shaking for which the lady with the vase would like to be warned to protect her vase. But that shaking is not going to cause any damage. You don't even start to get structural damage, maybe up until you get up to around 20% G, that's what's typically classified as MMI7 or very strong shaking. And so if I'm that fictional nuclear power plant, I don't, probably don't care about anything weaker than that, at least. So if I know what level of shaking is potentially hazardous to me, then I can just flip these axes around and ask, what is the smallest magnitude earthquake that I care about? What is the smallest magnitude earthquake that could potentially be in hazard to me? So if I'm 20 kilometers away from the earthquake and I'm the lady with the vase, then I care about magnitude four and a half earthquakes because a four and a half earthquake could potentially cause enough shaking to knock over my beloved vase. But if I'm that fictional nuclear power plant, I don't care about such weak shaking. In fact, I probably don't care about anything smaller than about a magnitude seven and a half earthquake. But here's the problem. Magnitude is the size of an earthquake, literally, physically. 
The thing that made Loma Prieta a magnitude 6.9 earthquake was the fact that it ruptured 25 kilometers of fault in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And, the fact, and what made the 1906 San Francisco earthquake a magnitude 7.9 instead of a magnitude 6.9 is the fact that it didn't just rupture 25 miles, it went on to rupture a fall 300 miles from San Juan Bautista all the way up to Cape Mendocino. And that spread shaking of a much higher intensity over a much larger region. And so the problem is, if I need to know that there's going to be very strong shaking up in Cape Mendocino or down in San Juan Bautista, I have to wait to see if this earthquake is going to go up to be the 1906 earthquake that is going to rupture all the way over there and produce very strong shaking at that location. And larger earthquakes take longer to happen because by definition, they have to run further. And so let's look side by side. At the top is going to be the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, and at the bottom is going to be the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And you can see them happening side by side. The red lines show their approximate rupture extents. And the Loma Prieta earthquake is a small earthquake. It's going to be over in about 15 seconds. It's going to rupture that entire red line, and then after that, it's just going to be propagating that shaking across the Bay Area. Whereas a 1906 earthquake is going to keep going. It's going to keep going for 150 miles to the south to San Juan Bautista and 150 miles to the north to Cape Mendocino. And it's going to take a long time to get there. It's going to take so long to get there that I'm going to get bored and advance the slide. So this is the key problem. Earthquakes are not psychic, and neither is earthquake early warning. Earthquakes don't know how large they are going to be in advance, right? There was very good reason to think that earthquakes, bigger earthquakes are just little earthquakes that didn't stop. That a magnitude eight earthquake is just a magnitude five earthquake that didn't stop and went on to become a magnitude six earthquake that didn't stop and went on to become a magnitude seven earthquake that didn't stop and went on to become a magnitude eight earthquake. So if I'm the lady with the vase, the one who cared about even a little magnitude five earthquake, like the 2014 La Habra earthquake, then it only takes me about a second to see that this earthquake goes from nucleation up to magnitude five and is something that is capable of knocking things off of shelves. But if instead I am that fictional nuclear power plant that doesn't care about anything bigger than anything smaller than about a magnitude seven and a half, who doesn't care about things smaller than, say, something like the 2010 El Mayor Cucapa earthquake from Baja, California, well, then I have to wait a second to see the earthquake go up to be a magnitude five that I still don't care about, and then three seconds for it to go up to be a magnitude six that I still don't care about, and then 15 seconds to see it grow up to be a magnitude seven and a half, maybe, that is actually something that I care about and I want to take action for. But the problem is the shaking has been coming at me the whole time. And if I wait to find out that this is a large magnitude earthquake, I am wasting valuable warning time. So the problem is that big earthquakes last a long time. You don't get more warning for bigger earthquakes. It just takes longer to see how big they are going to end up because earthquakes are not psychic and neither is earthquake early warning. So let's, let's do this quantitatively, right? How long does it take to get an earthquake alert out? So earthquake warning is not the same for everyone, right? Because it cares what level of shaking you care, because it depends on what level of shaking you care about. It takes longer to issue an alert for stronger shaking because you have to wait to see more earthquake happen, to see that this is in fact a large magnitude earthquake that is capable of producing stronger shaking. So if I'm 20 kilometers away from the earthquake, which is about 12 miles, and I am that lady with a vase who cares about light shaking that might knock over something from a shelf, then I only have to wait about a second to see that this earthquake is gonna go up to be a magnitude five, because a magnitude five could do that. But if I'm that fictional nuclear power plant that only cares about strong shaking, such that I have to wait to see if this thing is gonna go up to be a magnitude seven and a half earthquake, I mean, even if I'm optimistic and I assume that I can guess it's gonna be a magnitude seven and a half at around 12 seconds in, that's still waiting 12 seconds to see that this is a big magnitude earthquake that's potentially that could potentially damage heavy infrastructure. Meanwhile, the S wave that's carrying the heavy shaking is just coming at you at three and a half kilometers a second or two miles a second. So 
the question of how much warning time you get is not the same for everyone. In fact, it's not just a matter of where you are, it's also a matter of what level of shaking you care about. Because if you care about stronger shaking, if you are the fictional nuclear power plant instead of the lady with the vase, then you have to, then it takes longer to send you an alert because we have to wait to see that the earthquake is going to grow into a big magnitude earthquake. And what that means is that you get less warning time. In fact, you get more warning time for the weak or shaking that you care about because I can get you an alert out faster. So specifically, if I'm that lady with a vase who only cares about a little magnitude five earthquake and it only takes me a second to see a that this earthquake has grown up to be magnitude five, I can give you five seconds of warning. But if instead I have to wait to see that this grows up to be a magnitude seven and a half earthquake, well then I've waited too long and I've used up all of my warning time. And note that being farther away doesn't necessarily give you more warning time. It just means you have to, it takes even longer to issue an alert because you have to wait even longer to see that this earthquake is going to go up to be an even larger magnitude earthquake with an even longer rupture that is capable of producing strong shaking at a farther away location, not just at a closer location. So let's do that Southern San Andreas fault scenario again. So it starts, and again, there's some area that you just can't get an alert out to, but then I'm not sure that you do send an alert to everyone because right now, at this moment, this is a little earthquake in Southern California. It's far away from Los Angeles. The expected shaking in Los Angeles is less than 1% G. It's less than 1% G through most of Southern California. The shaking expected in Palm Springs is 2% G. So it's not enough to be a threat to heavy infrastructure, but you could warn a lady, for a, a lady with a vase in Palm Springs at this point that, hey, your vase may be in danger. Even as you move along, by the time that the shaking has gotten to be very strong in Palm Springs, you're still, you, you could predict um, that people with phases in San Bernardino and Anaheim should take action, but the expected shaking in Los Angeles is still just 1% G. By the time the shaking has reached San Bernardino, the predicted shaking in Los Angeles is now only strong enough that you would warn the lady with the vase. It's still not strong enough that it would necessarily be a threat to heavy infrastructure. In fact, even by the time the shaking arrives in Los Angeles a minute and a half later, that's only about the same time that you realize that the shaking is going to be quite strong in LA. The predicted shaking is still actually just 11% G. And so it's very hard to get a timely warning for the very strong levels of shaking that could potentially impact heavy infrastructure. So let's try this for a Northern San Andreas fault. And let's do this in real time. So at the bottom, what you're going to see is how long you have left until the shaking arrives in San Francisco. And you're going to see what the expected shaking is in San Francisco as a function of time. And the question you should ask yourself is, at what point do I want to be alerted? Because the longer I wait to know that the shaking is going to be strong in San Francisco, the less warning time I have left. So if I want to be alerted for 2% G to protect my vase, I could get almost a minute of warning. That's fantastic. But if I want to wait to see that the shaking is going to be 20% G, like very strong shaking or even severe shaking, well, by the time that happens, almost all the warning time is gone. So this is the fundamental question. Can you take a better safe than sorry approach where you accept alerts early and often for every little baby earthquake that's only expected to produce light shaking just in case it grows up to be a big earthquake that causes strong shaking? Or do you want to wait to know that the shaking at your location is going to be very strong and threatening, but then risk that perhaps the alert will come too late? And remember, most baby earthquakes will never go up to be big earthquakes, right? For on average, for every magnitude eight earthquake, like the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, there are 10 magnitude sevens, like the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, 100 magnitude six earthquakes, like the 2014 South Napa earthquake, 1,000 magnitude five earthquakes, like um, there was a 2,000 magnitude five in Yonville. In 2014, there was a La Habra earthquake in Los Angeles. Um, this morning in Los Angeles, there was a 
something just below a magnitude four, we get about 10,000 of those for every magnitude eight, 100,000 magnitude threes, et cetera. So who can benefit the most from earthquake early warning? I suspect the person who can benefit the most is the lady with the vase because she genuinely cares about weak shaking and we can provide long warning times for weak shaking. But then I think the next best potential user of earthquake early warning is this fictional train system. Because while the train technically only cares about strong shaking that could damage the tracks and the bridges and the heavy infrastructure, a train is probably also pretty fossil or tolerant, right? If you get an alert, you, can, you could say, give me an alert for weak shaking just in case it grows up to be strong shaking. Stop the train, and then if it doesn't grow up to be strong shaking, just accelerate again and continue with your schedule. But if you are someone who cares about strong shaking and can't afford to take action unnecessarily, right? If you are a fictional nuclear power plant that cannot afford an emergency shutdown unless you absolutely positively need to do an emergency shutdown, then earthquake early warning may not be for you. So the take home message, earthquakes are not psychic and neither is earthquake early warning. And warning time doesn't necessarily increase with distance. So the next time that you see a figure that has an earthquake epicenter for, surrounded by concentric circles of increasing warning time, you say no, because earthquakes are not psychic and neither is earthquake early warning. What earthquake early warning is, it's really a calculated risk, right? If you only take action when it is certain that the earthquake will produce damaging shaking at your location, you're gonna miss warnings for most damaging earthquakes. You have to gamble on taking action for small earthquakes just in, just in case they happen to produce strong shaking and hope in the long run, the odds pay off to your advantage. And so really it's time to think about earthquake early warning like a sped up version, a flash flood warning, or hurricane warning, or tornado warnings, or really any kind of natural hazards warning. Right? If you're in an affected area, you should take action to protect yourself, even though only a small fraction of people in your area will be directly impacted by the flood or the hurricane or the tornado or now the earthquake. I mean, how often have you received a flash flood warning? How often have you personally drowned in a flash flood? I hope the answer is zero. Uh, but the, what happens is you send an alert out to say a county in which flash flooding is possible and everybody takes protected action, even though only a small area will end up being directly impacted by flooding. Similarly, in this picture at the bottom, the tornado technically really only affected these three houses in the center, right? You kind of only had to alert them. Everybody else could have gone to their windows and enjoyed the nice tornado going through the neighborhood. That is not how tornado warning works, right? You warn the whole area and everybody takes shelter, even though only a few places will end up being directly impacted by the hazard. And that's how earthquake early warning works as well. You're going to warn everyone that might potentially eventually end up experiencing strong shaking, even though only a few or maybe even no people will end up feeling strong shaking. And in fact, if you think about it, that's exactly what happened in 1989. That's exactly what the Loma Prieta earthquake early warning system was doing. It was taking the better safe than sorry approach to earthquake early warning because they were warning for magnitude 3.7 and larger aftershocks. A magnitude 3.7 earthquake is tiny, right? That's almost exactly the same magnitude as the earthquake in Los Angeles this morning. That's very small and not likely to cause damage at all. But the idea was that here you have people in a very vulnerable position crawling around on a heavily damaged piece of highway. And so let's take a better safe than sorry approach and, pe and warn people for aftershocks, period, just in case one of these aftershocks turns out to be large enough that it ends up producing hazardous shaking at the location of the Cypress Street viaduct. Now I should warn that there's very little information about exactly what happened here. Um, you know, there was a lot of stuff happening and it was a lot of years ago and things weren't well documented. It's actually entirely possible that Caltrans did not have their receiver plugged in and didn't actually receive any of these alerts, but that is a different story for a different day. The point is, this was a system that was taking the better safe than sorry approach to earthquake early warning. So, 
Earthquake Early Warning is now live in California. You are in fact subscribed to them. It, alerts will be sent through the a wireless emergency alert system. Your phone, if you subscribe to emergency alerts like Amber Alerts and Weather Alerts, will go off if there is an earthquake warning. And there are also apps that you can download and customize to change um, what sort of alerts you receive and possibly get some uh, additional context information. So you could receive an alert today, tomorrow, a decade from now. So what should you do when you get an alert? You should drop, cover, and hold on. Please do not go outside, go to a doorway, go anywhere. Um, there are a lot more things that can hurt you outside than inside. Outside, there are falling bricks, there are power lines, there are air conditioners, there are gargoyles. And it turns out when you look back over um, a recent damaging California earthquakes, a lot of the injuries actually just come from moving, right? People try to walk while it's shaking and then they fall down and break their nose or they step on broken glass. So please do not go anywhere, just drop, cover, and hold on. Um, a really a tragic illustration of this is um, the 2003 magnitude 6.6 .6 San Simeon earthquake. This is a photo from Paso Robles. Uh, this building was damaged. Uh, people in the building actually were okay, but tragically two people were killed outside this building when the exterior collapsed. So please, do not go outside. Just wherever you are, drop, cover, and hold on. Um, Note that most alerts will be precautionary. We are taking the approach that we are going to send you alerts for weak shaking, just in case the little baby earthquake grows on to produce strong shaking that may be hazardous to you. We think that this is the winning strategy for earthquake early warning. It's best to play it better safe than sorry. Take action just in case the earthquake grows on to be hazardous. Thank you so much. So I am going to stop sharing my screen. Hello. Great job, Sarah. We really enjoyed the lecture. Outstanding. Um, what we're going to do now in the uh, seminar is take a few questions from the audience. So we've had questions submitted as we've gone along through the QA feature in Zoom. And so I will read the questions and we'll see what Dr. Minson uh, has to say about these. So let's start with the first one. Um, how are cities and counties other than Los Angeles and the state of California as a whole testing and evaluating applications of ShakeAlert? Uh, that's a great question. We did have a really robust beta program where we had our representatives from a broad range of different uh, sectors um, participating in, in trials and trying to understand how they would use earthquake early warning. But right now we're actually kind of past the beta stage. I mean, we are doing live public alerting as of last fall. You are all now receiving alerts. You just probably haven't because so the seismicity rates in California are fairly low and there haven't been very many events that have actually triggered alerts, but they are happening. We are all happening. We are basically mostly past the beta stage at this point. Okay. So I am guessing that there are quite a few people listening to your seminar who are thinking, gee, I'd really like to get an app on my phone that can uh, interact with the Shake Alert system. Is there one that you can recommend? Well, let's not say recommend. I don't think the United States government is in the business of recommending apps. First of all, you are getting alerts. I mean, assuming that you haven't turned off emergency notifications on your phone, if you get weather alerts or amber alerts on your phone, you will also get earthquake alerts if they come out. In addition to that, um, you can download apps that um, may that can customize, you know, the emergency alert system has some criteria for sending out alerts. You can also download an app where you can set your own criteria for the level of shaking for which you want to be alerted and make it higher or lower than the emergency alert system. Lower can be helpful. Higher, you're still going to get one through the um, emergency alert system. There are several available in the app store. There was one from the, um, the city and county of Los Angeles. There was one uh, from that's been developed by Cal OES in cooperation with UC Berkeley. There's at least one from a private company. They should all be good quality in the sense that they were all developed 
to certain standards that were set by Shakealot. They had to participate in those standards and get approval before the apps went out. So anyone you choose should be of acceptable quality, it should, and they also should be subscribing to the same information. It's really just a choice of what interface you like best. So help yourself to whichever one in the App Store makes you happy. Okay, and they, but you're sure you can find a few now on the App Store? Yes, there are at least three that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, great. Okay, so the next question, uh, you, I think you addressed in part during the seminar, but it's such an important point, I think it's worth highlighting, and that is, with the warning system, uh, suppose someone receives a warning, should they evacuate the building that they are in after receiving the warning? Please don't do that. Um, yeah, so really we think in California, given our building inventory, the thing that's most likely to happen is that something will happen to you if you try to move during a earthquake, or that something in your house, a bookcase, a chandelier, is going to come down on you. So really, we just want you to protect yourself by drop, cover, and holding on under a desk or a chair or a table, whatever you have. So just get down and get safe. Um, we do not think evacuation is the way to go. And given the time involved, there's just not going to be enough time, even if that was a good idea. But luckily, that's not what we think is the best course of action. Now, that's different than tsunamis. Obviously, if you're talking about tsunami hazard, then you are talking about at least vertical evacuation, if not actually land evacuation. But the time involved in tsunamis is much longer than earthquakes. In earthquakes, shaking decays exponentially with distance. So you're only talking about the area really close to the rupture, and the waves are coming at you at two miles a second, which is three and a half kilometers a second. Um, whereas a tsunami, if the earthquake is actually right off your coast, warning times are shorter, but you could potentially get a significant local tsunami from an earthquake on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, which means you could be talking about hours of warning time. So it's a completely different ball game with, particular, with a completely different response plan. So if you put the two of them together, ideally what you do is you feel shaking, you drop cover and hold on, get through the earthquake, and then if you're in a tsunami hazard zone, after all the shaking stops, then you go and um, evacuate to safety out of the tsunami zone. Good advice, thank you. Um, now, here at UCLA, we have quite a few uh, people in our department uh, who study ground motions. And so this question comes from that perspective. Uh, is the current, <clears throat> excuse me, is the current and will the new uh, shake alert monitoring stations meet data quality needs for seismologists and engineers. So for example, uh, with storing waveforms, um, archiving the data, and having adequate sample rates. Yes, um, the build out of the early warnings, uh, the build out of the seismic networks on the West Coast as part of the early warning system has been done through ANSS, that's the National mm -hmm. Scientific Seismic Network. So they all, they all meet the standard quality for scientific studies. And so the entire network should be dual use, not only for sending out thoughts, but also for original research, both from a science, a seismology and an engineering perspective. Okay, great. We'll certainly make use of that. Um, the next question has to do with what is sort of the end point of the earthquake early warning alerts. So the question specifically is, are there plans to build risk assessment and automated decision support into the earthquake early warning system? Or is it basically the alert and then the, the user decides uh, what to do with it? That is a great question. Um, I think that's kind of at the cutting edge of development at the moment. So it doesn't, it doesn't exist. There have been a number of interesting research articles sort of addressing those issues, but not in an operational sense. At the moment, I think the endpoint of the early warning system is basically a ground motion forecast. And right at this moment, if someone wanted to implement it, it would be on the user side to say, if I have this predicted shaking with this uncertainty on it, and I have this use case, you know, this fragility or whatever, and this risk, what is my analysis of what I want to do given this ground motion forecast? But at the moment, the early warning system 
only goes as far as the shaking forecast. Now, the next question um, gets into the, the legal realm. Yeah. And um, so the question here is, you know, suppose, uh, suppose that an alert is issued and uh, entities take action and suffer a loss as a result, maybe because of a false alarm. Um, so is there a concern about the potential liability of the USGS, uh, state of California, those issuing alerts, given that potential for, for false alarms? Well, <clears throat> to be very clear, I am not a train engineer, I am not a nuclear engineer, and I am also not a lawyer. So I cannot give you legal advice. Um, my, this has certainly been a discussion, and I think it's been more of a concern for cooperating institutions and potential end users. Um, the, the government entities that cooperate in the creation of Shake a Lord are government entities, and governments have certain special powers and protections. So I think, and in fact, we are mandated by Congress to provide earthquake uh, forecasts and warnings and whatnot. So this, this, this is our appointed role, um, which is obviously different than a private entity. So the USGS definitely has lawyers who definitely worry about this, but it's not the same for the governments involved as for private individuals. Okay. Um, a few more. Uh, let's see. This one is interesting. Does the analysis undertaken by this, the earthquake early warning system consider the uh, makeup of the local geology? Uh, that is an excellent question. So the shaking forecasts at the moment are being done through these ground motion prediction equations, um, which are empirical correlations. Some of them get quite fancy and have terms for many, many things, at least generally at least a VS30 term, which is the um, S-ray velocity at 30 meters depth, which is supposed to give you a sense of local site amplification. Some of them have additional terms for um, basins or whatever. It's really a choice of which particular GMPE you use. Um, and we've been playing around with that a little bit. And um, also there are some issues that we may not be able to really populate all the terms for your fancy or GMPEs because we have limited knowledge about the earthquake as it's happening. Like we may not necessarily know, you know, what its focal mechanism is and thus what its expected stress drop is supposed to be higher or lower. Um, the other thing is that Honestly, all these things are changing what the median expected shaking is, right? If I know a bunch of stuff about the geology or this, that, or the other thing is changing the median expected shaking, but you also have to ask the question is, what is the variance about that prediction? And the variances, even when you start plugging in things like lo local geology, are quite large. And that ends up being the thing that controls the uncertainty in the shaking forecast. It's not really the detecting of the earthquake or figuring, or figuring out the source parameters. It's the variability in ground motion. And if this talk had been an hour instead of half an hour, I would have spent the second half hour talking about uh, just how much uncertainty there is in ground motion forecasts. Yeah, but you have the VS30 term, so that is a first order effect of geology. In the yeah, field. basically mostly we're relying on magnitude, distance, and VS30. Right. Okay. Um, few more. So this question is about uh, the Northridge earthquake. Um, so the, the questioner states that 90% of the damage was within about 10 miles of the epicenter. Um, is it possible to have any kind of a warning so close to the fault? Yeah, so that's, that's uh, really an interesting question. Uh, David Ward actually uh, published a paper on this, like, I think within the last week in earthquake spectra. And yes, so these continental crust earthquakes in general tend to have very highly localized damage. And again, it's, it depends on how much time you need to take action. But you know, even if we're talking about drop cover and hold on, that means you probably need at least, you know, even if you got that alert immediately, if there was no latency in the system, you probably need at least five seconds to get to safety before that, you know, and even longer if you um, 
are mobility impaired in some way or have to, uh, or otherwise have difficulty moving or finding a safe place. And by definition, that creates not just the no alert zone we were talking about in terms of the system, but then a no alert zone in terms of how far away you have to be to have it take long enough for the shaking to get to you, that you have physically enough time to get to safety. And that does mean that for, you know, often there will be places of the, of the, that are hardest hit in a continental crust earthquake that is unfortunately, you know, just going to have such short warning times that it's going to be difficult to take sufficient protective action. And that's literally just the physics of how fast seismic waves are coming at you. Sure. Now, one question I'm sure you've gotten a lot uh, that we can expand on based on this morning's experience. Why didn't we get an alert from the Ridgecrest earthquake? And to expand upon that, why didn't we get an alert from this morning's earthquake? Oh, these are excellent questions. Um, and this comes back to the talk that didn't happen, the talk about how uncertain shaking is. And so when you combine shaking uncertainty with the gutenberg uh, Richter relationship, it means that you have a tendency to miss amplified shaking, right? When you have stronger shaking than expected from an earthquake. Um, and so there was, always a margin error built into an early warning system. Like you say, I care about this level of shaking, but I don't want to miss this level of shaking. So really I'm gonna send you an alert when I think the level of shaking is just down here. So when the Ridgecrest earthquakes happen, what the goal was, was to say, okay, let's pick MMI six, that strong shaking. You know, we think that could maybe start to be a little hazardous. So we want to warn people. We wanna make sure that people who feel MMI six get warned. So for safety, we're gonna send an alert every time we expect the shaking to be MMI4. Um, so the goal was not to warn people for MMI4 shaking. If the goal had been to warn people for MMI4 shaking, the, 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 the alerting threshold would have been even lower. So the Ridgecrest earthquake happens. We calculate where we think MMI4 shaking is going to be. The magnitude, and, and Los Angeles is just on the edge of that. And the magnitude is just a tiny bit low. So, that, so Los Angeles ends up being just outside the MMI4 contour and they don't get an alert. Which was in a sense fine because the goal was to alert for MMI6 shaking and there was not MMI6 shaking in Los, Los Angeles. It was four, maybe five. Um, so after that, some people, but not everyone, but there were a number of people who were like, you know, I actually would have liked to have gotten a lot for that shaking. And so now the, the alerting criteria has gone down. So it says, okay, we want to warn you for MMI4. And so we're actually going to warn you for more like MMI3 or something in the hopes of making sure that if there's MMI4, you will get that a lot. Um, but even so, we've been putting a magnitude limit on it for safety as well. And that magnitude limit is more up like four and a half, five. That also has gotten changed around a little bit. Um, and so this earthquake this morning was just 3.8, I think it was. And so that was so tiny that it was just like, no, because that comes back to the Northridge problem, you know, in overdrive, right? The area that actually felt that shaking it, that could potentially have, you know, had a vase knocked over is so tiny that there would not, even if the system had been instantaneous, you know, there wouldn't have been time for anyone to actually grab a vase. Um, but the, the thing about Los Angeles is that the experiences were, were very varied, right? Because Los Angeles has high rises. And if you are at the top of a high rise and long period shaking comes in, you can feel very strong shaking that the people on the ground did not feel. And that becomes an even more complex problem of who do you warn? Like, do we need to be going to shaking forecasts that somehow understand the type of building you're in and give you an alert if you're on the 20th floor, but not if you're on the first floor? I mean, this is, this is all discussions and cutting edge stuff, but, but your experience varies not just in X and Y, but also in Z. Sure, sure. Um, I think we can probably take time for one more and then we should probably wrap it up. And that is, um, obviously, we focus here on the state of California. Um, but, you know, the, the technology developed through ShakeAlert would be beneficial 
uh, in many places around the U.S. and around the world. So, are there efforts to to sort of scale it up uh, within the United States or globally? Yes. So the the plan for shake for shake a lot at the moment is to. Um, do warning throughout the West Coast, so California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, but it's been rolled out in stages. So last year when Ridgecrest was happening, um, only Los Angeles County was alerting at that moment. Um, then last fall on the Loma Prieta anniversary, we expanded to all of California. And um, we will soon be expanding to Oregon and Washington as well. We do not have uh, a definite date for that. And obviously with a global pandemic, this may not be the best time to be worrying about that. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, uh, this has been very informative. Uh, your presentation was really enjoyed by a large number of people. Um, thank you so much. We've all learned a lot about it. Um, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be the, the drag lecturer and to do this online. Um, I would also like to thank once again, uh, Leslie and Dennis Drag, who I believe are on the call. So thank you so much for your support of this uh, lecture series. Uh, thank you to the audience. And I would just like to remind you again that this lecture has been recorded. And should you want to uh, get a link to the recording, that will be available in a follow-up email. Go Bruins and be safe.